It's the dead of night, but by the light of the moon, you can see the heads of sailors bobbing up and down in the water. Hundreds of men stranded out in the middle of the ocean, days without food or fresh water. And still, help has not come. Some have begun to doubt if it ever will. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream rips through the darkness, immediately followed by a bone-chilling silence. You didn't see what happened, but you know. Another poor soul has been dragged down into the dark depths below to be devoured just like the countless men before him. All you can do is wait and hope that you're not next. World War II was nearing its end Private Edgar Harrell was assigned to the Marine Guard aboard the USS Indianapolis, which many referred to as the Indy. With 10 battle stars, the heavy cruiser was the flagship of the 5th Fleet and was President Roosevelt's ship of state. Currently, the Indy was docked in a shipyard in California for repairs, and it just so happened to be in the right place and at the right time for a top secret mission. A large, mysterious crate was loaded onto the ship. Nobody knew what they were transporting, not even Captain McVeigh. Edgar was one of 39 Marines assigned to guard the crate, but he suspected that the two officers carrying strange canisters who had boarded along with the giant mystery box were far more important. He was right, because the officers were from the Manhattan Project, and they were carrying half the world's supply of enriched uranium-235 that would be used to end the war. The captain at least knew the mission's importance, so he pushed the Indy and set the world record for a speed run from San Francisco before sprinting to Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Their last stop was Tinian Island, where they dropped off the officers and components that would become part of the Little Boy atomic bomb, which was dropped on Hiroshima 11 days later. From there, they went to Guam, then started towards Leyte, Philippines for extra training before rejoining the invasion of Japan. The routing office told Captain McVeigh that the route was safe, but key intelligence that said otherwise was kept from him. As a result, they would never make it to Leyte because of what was waiting for them beneath the waves. There's something waiting for you beneath the waves too, by the way. Around 300 species of fish for you to catch in today's sponsor, Fishing Clash. Fishing Clash allows me to experience scenic locales without subjecting myself to the horrifying dangers of the outdoors. Like the crystal clear ocean waters of the Florida coast, where I caught my first fish, a shark. Which is eerily fitting as you'll find out later in this video. Or the misty shores surrounding the tranquil waters of Loch Ness. Now, I know what you're thinking, can you catch the elusive cryptid Nessie? Well, you'll just have to download the game and find out for yourself. What I will tell you is that in Fishing Clash, there are real-life monsters lurking in the prehistoric waters of the Lost World, like the Mega Piranha, which is believed to have been ten times bigger than today's piranhas and have a bite proportionally stronger than even the King of Sharks, Megalodon, which you can also hunt for in this game. And that's my favorite thing about Fishing Clash, collecting and learning about all these real marine animal species as well as legendary creatures while I get to enjoy fun and satisfying gameplay with some of the prettiest visuals in mobile gaming. Play Fishing Clash for free and help support our our channel for more videos like this one. By the way, Fishing Clash has also become a sponsor of the Major League Fishing Angler of the Year awards, including the $100,000 Bass Pro Tour Fishing Clash Angler of the Year. Follow the Fishing Clash Instagram and Facebook to stay tuned on the latest news. And of course, download the game by using our link in the description box or scan the QR code you see on screen and use our special gift code BREW to get a special $20 value reward, including a unique avatar for free. Now, back to the USS Indianapolis, which was unwittingly sailing right into a trap. Harlan Twibble had just graduated from the Naval Academy at 23, and his first assignment was as a gunnery officer on the Indy. On the overcast night of July 29, 1945, he was on navigation when the clock struck midnight, indicating a shift change was underway. Meanwhile, Edgar, who was ecstatic because he had been promoted to sergeant that day, got off watch. He grabbed his blanket from below deck and set up a pallet underneath the frontmost gun to enjoy the sea air while he got some sleep. Little did he know, lingering in the water nearby was the Japanese I-58 submarine. When the clouds broke, Commander Hashimoto spotted the tiny silhouette of the Indy in the moonlight. He ordered his crew to fire six torpedoes in a spread towards the battleship before disappearing into the depths. It was about 12 minutes after midnight, and Edgar was just dozing off when a column of fire and water erupted before his eyes. In a split second, 30 feet of the bow was gone. 
Harlan was on his way to the crew quarters when he was hit by shrapnel before a second explosion rocked the ship. Crewmen ran outside, burned in a flash, pleading, leaving skin attached to bulkheads as they touched it. Only two of the six torpedoes hit, but it was enough. Captain McVeigh had to act fast. Power was out, so they couldn't reach engineering to stop the ship. As they pushed forward, water rushed into the exposed bow. The operator believed he got out a distress signal with auxiliary power, but now, McVeigh had to get the men off the ship because it was going down. As the ship started to list to the starboard side, Edgar was dangling by the railing. He heard the captain shouting at the top of his lungs, Abandon ship! Abandon ship! So Edgar prayed and jumped. Meanwhile, Harlan couldn't find someone to take charge. As the ship started to roll, he yelled out, Abandon ship! But nobody moved, frozen with fear. So he yelled, Follow me! And jumped. The others built up the courage and jumped with him. In the water, all Harlan and Edgar could do was get away from the ship and watch. It took just 12 minutes for the top-heavy ship they called home to roll and sink to the bottom of the ocean. Around 900 of the 1196 crew survived the initial attack. And as the sun rose in the sky that morning, they were hopeful that rescue would soon come. But little did they know that nobody was coming, and they were going to go through a nightmare darker than the depths of the ocean that would make many wish that they had gone down with the ship. Everyone jumped ship in such a rush that they couldn't deploy the lifeboats. Some were sleeping or showering when the torpedoes hit, so they were wearing little to no clothing. A few rafts were deployed, but not enough for the 900 men. To make matters worse, the ship had ejected all of its oil, so now the men were covered in thick oil, cold, injured, scattered, and confused. And if that wasn't bad enough, many men were bleeding, turning the water red and attracting another enemy lurking below. Lingering in the deep, the oceanic white-tipped sharks were prowling around, looking for their next meal. And when explosions vibrated through the water, followed by the splashing of frantic men, they felt the ripples from miles away and had to investigate. The closer they got, the more they smell it. Blood. Edgar was in a group of 80 men when a blood-curdling scream caught his attention. Looking around frantically, and he could just make out a flurry of three sharks dragging a man into the depths. When the man floated back up, his lower torso was missing. Fins surrounded them, and through the clear water, Edgar could see hundreds of sharks circling below. At first, the sharks mostly went for the bounty of dead bodies from the ones who succumbed to their injuries before the sun even rose. However, as time passed, they started to attack the living. Harlan was in a group of a few hundred. As his fellow crewmates died, he pushed their bodies away from the group for the sharks to feast on. He also set up a watch, and when a shark approached, the survivors would kick the sharks away, and surprisingly, it worked. The men were scared and tired, but they knew an SOS signal had been sent out, so they were certain rescue would be there in half a day. But when a whole day passed, and then another, that hope vanished. Why wasn't anyone coming? Decades after the incident, three men would come forward to say each of their stations had received distress signals from the Indy and didn't respond for different reasons. The only problem is that radio logbooks show no record of any SOS being received. What historians believe most likely happened was that the distress signal never went out due to the loss of power on the ship. But what is clear is that there was still negligence on the part of the US Navy. They had key intelligence that submarines were in those waters, and the captain wasn't warned. Then, when the Indy didn't arrive at its final destination in Leyte, it was assumed that they had been rerouted elsewhere, and no follow-up was done. Moreover, intelligence had even intercepted a message from the Japanese I-58 sub about a sunk vessel that night, but the information was ignored due to the lack of ship ID or location. So, due to a series of negligence, rescue wasn't coming which meant the crew of the Indy had to face not only man-eating sharks, but also two more enemies, the elements and each other. While the sharks had their fill, the survivors grew more hungry by the day. On the third day, Edgar's group of 17, which had dwindled from the original 80, found a crate full of potatoes that were rotten, but still edible if they ate around the bad parts. Other survivors even found crates containing crackers or spam, but not all of them were as lucky, and many starved. And as the sun beat down, dehydration set in. The sailors knew salt water was dangerous to drink, but when you are desperately thirsty, that crisp, shimmering water looks mighty tasty. 
Despite warnings from other men, some of them started to drink the salt water. Mixed with the spilled oil, it didn't help quench the thirst, but instead had ill effects. The survivors described these men as going crazy, seeing things that weren't there, like trying to swim to invisible islands. Edgar even witnessed a man attack a nearby soldier, thinking he was an enemy. Exhaustion, dehydration, hypothermia, salt toxicity, injuries from the torpedoes, sharks? Men were dying all around. Especially with no rescue in sight, spirits were low. Some of the survivors even gave up, letting the deep, dark sea take them. But after five freezing nights and four grueling days, hope. The remaining shipwrecked survivors heard the whirl of an engine coming towards them. A plane. Problem was, they didn't know if it was friend or foe. Chuck Gwynn was flying a PV-1 Ventura on a routine patrol when he spotted oil in the water. That usually meant a submarine was in the area, so he told his co-pilot and crew to prepare for attack. Meanwhile, in the water, the sailors waved their arms frantically, trying to get the pilot's attention. The plane descended on the watch for submarines, going into an offensive with depth charges at the ready. But that's when Chuck noticed bumps in the oil. Descending even lower, he realized to his surprise, those bumps were men. Hundreds of men spread over 25 miles. He called out on the radio, Ducks on the pond, ducks on the pond. More planes started showing up, dropping rafts and canteens of water to the relief of the survivors. But the rescue ships were still at least half a day out. Adrian Marks was one of the first pilots on the scene with an amphibious PBY Catalina. They had strict orders to not land in the 15-foot swells, but he saw some of the soldiers in the water being attacked by sharks and decided to attempt a landing anyway. The plane descended, his pontoon skipped on the water, trying to navigate the swells, until he landed successfully. They saved straggling sailors, filling the plane to the brim like sardines in a can, and even strapping sailors to the wings with parachute cords. Unfortunately, this damaged the wings, rendering the vehicle unflyable. But this brave act kept 56 sailors out of the dangerous waters. A full five days had passed since the Indy's sinking. It was just after midnight when the USS Cecil J. Doyle arrived, shining its brilliant spotlight, an image Edgar and Harlan would always remember. It took a full day and seven ships to rescue the men. In the end, only 316 of them had survived. Of the 879 men who died, it's believed that only between a dozen to 150 died from shark attacks. So while sharks weren't responsible for most of the deaths, the Navy didn't want to take the blame either. Not if they had anything to say about it. Captain McVeigh survived, but sharks were still circling him. Despite their obvious negligence, the Navy wanted to court-martial the skipper. They were searching for anything, and in the end, blamed him for the sinking because he didn't zigzag to avoid enemy subs. Even though the routing office said zigzagging was discretionary and they didn't notify him of any subs in the area. And so, Captain McVeigh was the first captain ever to be court-martialed for his ship sinking during wartime. McVeigh was constantly sent hate mail or calls from the families of the deceased. Even on Christmas Day, he got a letter that said, Merry Christmas! Our family's holiday would be a lot merrier if you hadn't killed my son. Eventually, in 1968, at the age of 70, he would take his own life. The survivors of the ordeal started reunions in 1960, and one of their main objectives was to clear Captain McVeigh's name. They stood by their captain and his decisions, knowing it was all politics. As one of the survivors, Dick Thielen, said, many a head should have rolled before they ever got to the captain. Finally, decades later, in 1996, they got help from one of the unlikeliest of people, a sixth grader who reported on the USSS Indianapolis, Hunter Scott. He made waves by bringing national attention to the issue, and Congress got wind of it. In 1999, they held hearings for the survivors to testify. Even Commander Hashimoto from the I-58 submarine wrote to the US Congress. His letter went on to say, I do not understand why Captain McVeigh was court-martialed. I do not understand why he was convicted on the charge of hazarding his ship by failing to zigzag because I would have been able to launch a successful torpedo attack against his ship whether it had been zigzagging or not. Our peoples have forgiven each other for that terrible war and its consequences. Perhaps it is time your peoples forgave Captain McVeigh for the humiliation of his unjust conviction. Finally, in 2000, 
Congress passed a resolution that was signed by President Clinton to exonerate the captain of all wrongdoings. While McVeigh had passed decades before, this brought peace to the survivors as well as his two sons and their children. The survivors continued to meet up for years after that, and even Commander Hashimoto's granddaughter, Atsuko Ida, started going in 2001. The objective of the elderly survivors was to tell their story before they were gone. Most have passed now, with Harold Bray as the last living survivor. However, they founded the USS Indianapolis Legacy Organization, which is keeping their story alive. Thanks again Fishing Clash for sponsoring this video. Play Fishing Clash for free and help support our channel for more videos like this one.